it seems like there's a good reason to talk about this just because it happened with it yesterday or a few days ago. Uh, if you followed this story about the Google employee who who declared Lambda one of the AI bots sentient. to be sentient. Yeah. Okay. The silliness with which such a large fraction of our collective intelligence was effusively oriented towards something is, is just evidence of the ease by which a relatively mediocre AI, if improperly deployed, could take advantage of our lower natures and the decadent corruption and otherwise uh, profane aspects of, our, of the paperclip maximizer in which we live to further the process of converting us all into paperclips. Hmm. <laughs> that's, that's so this, this is the problem that I see. Yeah. Um, it's less a problem of sort of like everything's hunky dory, but we accidentally create, you know, Terminator two or something like that. It's more like, it's all part of a, of a reciprocal narrowing that we yeah. call civilization and that we're, we're living within. And we need to actually find our way out of that in general. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. I think like one of the things that I think is going to be important in this conversation is that is that it's going to be when I listen to Jordan, when I listen to you speak, sometimes I don't understand what you're saying. And I think part of it is just terminology. You have a whole set of, of terms that are different from the ones that I use. And I've learned to, I've learned to, to know John's terms. And so I kind of understand what, when he says something, I know I kind of have a background to what he said, to what he's saying. Whereas you, sometimes I hear you say something and you, and the conversation continues. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't get, like, I didn't understand what he's referring to there. And so yeah. I think that we'll have to be like, at least you'll have to be generous with me in this conversation. Sometimes I'll stop you and say, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't know what that, what that term means. Well, maybe I can even, even broaden it. My sense as I've been contemplating this conversation is that we'll actually want to be consciously moving quite slowly mm -hmm. uh, because the thing that we're dealing with is um, <laughs> in some sense, the most esoteric thing possible. Um, and uh, language itself isn't going to be an adequate tool for addressing it. I yeah, agree. that makes sense. So we've got to uh, listen to each other, but follow the logos. So that's going to be, it's going to require all of our virtuosity and virtue. Um, so. And so I guess, I mean, this conversation, I guess, was sparked by a discussion, Jordan, that you had with a few other people on Rebel Wisdom about egregores. And I think that the notion of egregores has been kind of floating around. I've been seeing different people uh, talk about it. Also, because everybody seems to be reading Tomberg's meditations on the tarot right now, which I'm reading at this moment. And he also talks about egregores as well. And this, this spawned several articles on my website from people that are kind of in my mind space, uh, you know, talking about my, the way I talk about higher beings and challenging it, trying to figure it out. And so that's what at least sparked my interest in having a conversation about this, which is to try to understand agency at transpersonal levels what does that mean is there agency is there consciousness can we perceive it you know how do we participate in that uh that's the thing that interests me very much these days and i think it also i mean john i know it's part of your work and yep. jordan i with that conversation i saw that you were definitely thinking about it so yes well i would say something like um this question this category question simultaneously is um radically under considered in the, I would call it maybe conventional wisdom within the sort of the, to the degree to which people are thinking about how to act in the world. Very few of those who have agency in, in a sort of material sense, at least consider this category properly or even at all in most cases. And to the degree to which this category has any degree of reality, it's obviously uh, significantly impactful. So that's a high asymmetry. Um, and I've, uh, I think frankly, maybe of the three of us been more along the lines of the mainstream, meaning up until relatively recently, these sorts of notions popped into my head, but I didn't think about them that much. 
and then over the past five to seven years, uh, increasingly found myself frankly obligated to contemplate them more deeply. Um, and so I'm coming in as a, as a bit of, much more of a novice, I would imagine, um, in the category. So you can see I'm, I'm maybe representing almost more of an audience than a um, contributor, but motivated participatory audience. Hmm. So, so, I mean, where I'm coming at is, I mean, I've recently published three papers with Dan Chiappi and, you know, um, important academic journals, uh, really exploring distributed cognition. That's what it's called in 4E Cogsci. This has been talked about deeply in 4E Cogsci, uh, especially the work of Chalmers and Clark for a long time. Ed Hutchins' work on cognition in the wild, where he talked about uh, the distributed cognition, the dynamical system that navigates a ship was in the 80s. Uh, uh, so this topic has been part of the part of the, the, the one of the fourth E is extended and part of calling uh, uh, cognition extended is exactly the idea of distributed cognition and dynamical systems. <clears throat> uh, and I think we should pay more attention to that uh, very often fine grained working out around it and it's, it's and it is being worked out. Uh, one way I would recommend right away is that I would I would challenge the word egregore, which I think is a bad term, an infelicitous term, um, in that it already misframes the phenomena we are trying to talk about, because it's based on the idea of aggregation, uh, which is a completely bottom up understanding of the phenomena. That's what aggregation means. I put a bunch of, I draw a bunch of things together and something emerges from them. And the problem with that purely bottom up model is it only gets half of the story uh, that is actually the case in distributed cognition. This is something Jonathan and I have talked about and Jordan, you and I have talked about it to a degree too. Uh, to the degree to which these things take on a life of their own, and are properly understood as hyper agents, that's my term, or spirits, that's uh, Jonathan's term, and I'm not using that term prejudicially at all. Um, um, they, we have to really understand uh, the top-down element in them uh, from the very beginning. Um, and um, I think the degree to which we try to have these, these, these purely either bottom-up or top-down models of these kind of phenomena which are, are the great temptations is the degree to which we are falling into a, we're, we're starting off on the wrong foot in a fundamental way. I, I tend to prefer the term hyper agent, or, which is analogous to Morton's idea of hyper objects. And so it, has a, it already has a good provenance and it, it captures the discourse around the agency of the collective intelligence found within distributed cognition. Those are the three terms I would like to put at the front hyper agency, collective intelligence, distributed cognition, and put them within a framework that is not just bottom up, but also equally top down. Uh, so that's my first proposal. Mm. Uh, my sense is I'm coming at it almost in the direction of a, of a blind man feeling the landscape and trying to notice what the different things are in the landscape. And I'm mm. not quite sure what, what, what's there. Um, and it seems like there's probably a number of distinct kinds of things that are not all the same. Mm. Um, but it might be useful to discern the distinctions and um, and some sense of like, what would you call it? The, not the, the bestiary? What's a, what's a collection of beings called? Definitely don't want to call it a pantheon, but you know what I'm saying. A collection. Bestiary, a bestiary or a taxonomy. Yeah. Taxonomy, taxonomy. yeah. Taxonomy. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I think that the way that I, because I've been thinking a lot about this egregore, and also I've been provoked and kind of challenged by my own, the people that that, that follow what I'm doing and are thinking in similar terms as, as I am. Uh, and one of the things that they've noticed is that there are certain, let's say there are collective beings or like hyper agents, the way that John talks about, that seem to uh, have let's say have more logos that seem to be teleologically structured. Let's say the, the navigation of a ship, for example. Mm -hmm. So the navigation of a ship will have a clear hierarchy and there'll be a captain who will, let's say, be the top of the, of the way that it, the direction that it's going, he's going to manage the other, but they're all working together and paying attention to the same telos. And so they're able to function as a, yeah, as a body. 
you know, but there are also versions of these beings that seem to be something like headless. And this is what some of my, my friends have pointed to me, pointed out to me, and that they seem to be more, uh, they seem to pop up and disappear. And so you see that the, the type of being that Jordan was talking about in his discussion about these, these weird morality codes that rise up online and then start to manage the way that people act. Uh, mm. They seem to be these headless beings, but they are, they do have, they act upon the group. They have ah, causative power. And so they look like, that's why there's something of a monstrous effect. And that's why th these people, we're, I'm going I'm to have a conversation with them as well re soon, but that why they said maybe the term egregore is good for these types of, of, of manifestations, which are these, like a mob, for example, that, that is swerving and then people pop up. Like if you look at Tiananmen Square is a great example of, of this when, when it was happening. You'd have you had this mob of people and then all of a sudden a leader would pop up and then people would kind of start to follow that leader for you know, like an hour. And then someone else would scream somewhere else. And then people would just like be moving from head to head and they couldn't find a uh, clear direction and, and really is like this. So it does have a kind of agency, but I mean, you would say something like a demonic agency. It's, it's break. It's it doesn't have a, a clear telos, let's say. Well, that's where I'd want to challenge it. I think I okay. like I like the distinction, and I now see how I would respond. I'd say if you want to reserve aggregor to those things, those processes that are self-organizing but are not autopoetic, then that is exactly where the, the boundary of agency is lost. Mm -hmm. The tornado is self-organizing, and that to me is what's happening in Tiananmen Square. You're having a social tornado, but it is not autopoetic in that it does not self-organize in order to seek out the conditions that produce, promote, and protect its own existence, whereas I take it that hyper-agencies do. So an example of a hyper-agency that clearly does this is a bureaucracy. Bureaucracies, in fact, often become totally just self-perpetuating entities that have been self, they self organized for this telos, but the autopoetic element takes over and sometimes to horrific degrees. That's in Kafka, right? And yeah. so, right. So I, I, I'm now seeing a continuum. But to me, the, the line uh, where we ascribe agency is precisely the line of where the self-organization has passed properly into being autopoetic. And when there is no evidence for autopoesis, we should not ascribe agency. And when uh, what we, can, we, can, we, we can ascribe sophistic, very sophisticated self-organization. And if that's what people want to point to with the term aggregor, then I think it's a good term for that phenomena. And I, I'm willing to accept that correction. But for me, I, well, I, I'm interested in uh, the capacity uh, for reality to produce hyper agents uh, because they, to me, have a significance for our understand. We have always understood our agency in relationship to some kind of hyper agency. To me, I think that's part of your point, Jonathan, right? Human beings have always understood ourselves in terms of hyper agents. And so I think the current discovery of hyper agency has a spiritual potential and significance that the discovery of just these, so, of social self-organization does not have. Okay, let me throw something in that just came up and I'm not sure this is a good idea, but it, it occurs to me um, that to the degree to which um, this conversation has a capacity to be an embodiment or a manifestation of one of these kinds of beings, yes, <clears throat> that would be the self-referentially proper way to guide its directionality. Yes. In some yeah. sense, what being is endeavoring to express itself to these particular humans? So we can take it as a applied exper experiment. Excellent. Um, Something that I noticed that this particular one seems to have as a orientation is precision. And as you were talking about the distinction between a tornado and let's say something else, um, I wanted to get very, very close because that line is actually a very in, in subtle line. Yes. But yeah. If I zoom in at the edge of a tornado, there actually is a shift in the probability of Brownian motion at the event horizon of the causal structures of air molecules mm -hmm. that is what produces the uh, autocatalytic characteristic. Yes. The distinction between autocatalytic and autopoetic yes. is the fine point. 
And I'd be interested to see if it's worth spending time trying to get down there, although it is, of course, a tremendous rabbit hole and may implicate the whole question. Well, um, I don't want to trespass on Jonathan, but I, I, since I, I think the question is directed towards me, uh, for me, um, the, um, the, the autocatalytic, and, and this is, of course, you know, what Kaufman says, it's, it might be necessary, but it's not sufficient for life because, because an autocatalytic process, right, is in some sense perpetuating itself, but it is nevertheless not seeking out the conditions that have to uh, obtain. And so my evidence for that is tornadoes will move onto terrain that immediately destroys them. And as Jonathan was saying, the self-organization is starting to coalesce into, you know, something that might do something around this leader, and then it shifts to this leader, and then it shifts to this leader, right? And so it's not, there is not, there is no, there is no, well, to my mind, there is not enough top down. And that's why I wanted to emphasize in, in, in the aggregor, I'll use that term now to refer to these it, it, social social self organizations social so, self organizations if that's okay um, there's not enough top down to attribute cognition um, because I take it that what we're trying to talk about when we're talking about things like when we are invoking terms like spirit um, or what I try to invoke like hyper agent is we have something that has the has a capacity to not just self-perpetuate, but to self-promote and self-protect. And that in that sense, we want to sort of equally attribute cognition and something like a life to it. Okay, so, so me, the other thing I'd like to bring into this, what you're saying, John, is what would be the difference between, let's say, so we have the notion of a, of a being that is properly organized towards the telos and structures itself hierarchically in a way that that seems to give it agency, right? So then we have these, these momentary beings that kind of shift from one, one way to the other and don't seem to be able to do that. And then you have something, what I would call something like parasitic processes. Yes, so, yes. Right? So let's say I see that e more easily within, 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 oh, let's say the mob. So the mob is a good example, like at, at a social level. And that an, ad, an addiction would be a good example at a personal mm -hmm, level, mm -hmm. yes, where yes. you have a, a process that Excellent. is self-perpetuating, that has all the mechanisms to preserve itself, but then is can ultimately be the demise of the, the structure that holds it together, can ultimately yes. kind yes. of break, can kill you. Like So you can have yes. an addictive pattern within you yes. that is yes. doing all these things, but then it ultimately could, could act against against the body that's holding it together. It's funny, as you were saying that, I immediately thought of parasitic processing. So I think I'm right. I'm really catching your perspective, I hope. But yeah, I think, I, I think it, um, the idea of, uh, uh, of something like a self-organizing process that um, is parasitic, and, and, but is nevertheless self-destructive of what we might call it substrate. Uh, I'm trying mm -hmm. to use terms very neutrally here. Um, yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, but the, I mean, since I coined the term with Leo, I, I, I guess I can speak to its provenance. The intent of parasitic processing is it's actually something that is destroying agency. That's one of its defining features. It, 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 it insinuates itself into the agency of well, in the case we originally talking about of an individual cognizer takes on a life of its own, but but at the expense of the agency that it is dependent upon. Um, and so for me, um, that's I, I think what that calls for then. It, I mean, I, I, I feel what's happening is we're being called to like a, a continuum in the taxonomy. We've got egregores and then we have hyper agents. And now there's this in between thing. Um, I, I, and mm -hmm. I, yeah. To me, it doesn't it doesn't cross the line, the threshold into hyper agency because uh, it's like an addiction. It's ultimately uh, uh -huh. it's a twist in the potential for agency that is being actualized as the self destruction of agency. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, the, one of the reasons why I'm I'm using I'm trying to bring that up is just because I I'm also trying to account for the iconography. Let's say that is. One of the reasons why demons are represented the way they are, like if, if you look at the way demons are represented, they're always represented as hybrid monsters. That is, yeah. they're represented in a way that they have no definite identity, but they yeah. can nonetheless act on you. 
and they act on you in a manner that wants to, like you said, John, to destroy your agency, to destroy your, your being, basically. Yeah. They want the, mm. the humans ultimately want to Very feed nice. off of you until you die. And so they, they're actually yeah. represented visually, if you look at the way they're represented in, in the medieval uh, art, in a way that seems to represent what this problem that we're talking about. So they're like, they're, they're egregores in a way because they're like this mismatch of, of uh, beings, you know, they're like a fish mixed with the, with the human mixed with, you know, with the tail and all these weird things. But then it also is able to act upon you and in a way that's violent, right? They're sticking forks with <clears throat> you. They're, they're, they're basically torturing you ultimately. Mm. Okay. I like where this is going. I like the, how we're getting this, uh, this articulation of, uh, of the continuum that is trying to be birthed in the taxonomy. I like this a lot. So let me throw some more <clears throat> parameters or um, what you call that? So like edges, shape. Um, one is something like closure, uh, thermodynamics, closed system, disconnection, separation. Okay. Mm. Uh, and in particular, something like the metaphor of, of death. So if I consider, for example, an animate body, let's just go with a rabbit that's hopping about as a, as a being, and then it's a dead rabbit, right? The, something has happened, a discontinuity has occurred. The mm -hmm. physical body and the components that made up that physical body are now subject to a completely different regime of dynamics, right? They've now become thermodynamic in characteristic. Uh, in fact, if a more fundamental notion, I think, of parasitic process, which is there's a gradient of possibility or a stored yes. capacity that has been built up by the organic being, which yes. is now a feedstock for a completely different set of regimes that are, in fact, from in relationship with the with the rabbit, are, in fact, bottoms up. Right? There are bacteria and predators and parasites and whatnot that are going to decompose that stored energy, which is living precisely in the gap between what was at one point a, a autopoetic process and is now transitioned. Okay, that's one. Two. Um, uh -huh, yeah. The, the mm, how would we say, the, the, the confusion that arises when something of that sort, let's just go with the bunny that died for a moment, happens to be made up of human beings. Aha. Uh -huh. The difference between a tornado and the mob is that a tornado, it was made up of air molecules. Yes. And the affordance of air molecules for engaging in cognition in any meaningful way is quite small. Right. Whereas the mob is made up of human beings. And so the affordance of human beings for engaging in cognition is relatively quite high. Yes. And so we may ascribe to the mob a level of cognition that is in fact not properly happening at the mob, but is what happens when something that was alive is now in this parasitic process dynamic, but its subcomponents are in fact fully functioning cognitive agents. And that creates the, a little bit of a confusion about what's actually going on. Yeah. Oh, I see. That, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yes. So there's a, you're saying there's a great temptation for, we have to be very careful of a category, in a classical sense, a category mis mistake. Of yes. Mis misapplying between the species and the genus. Yes. And if yes. you take the notion of short term and long term, or, or, or uh, what's it called? Global optimum and uh, local optimum. Yeah. And apply that against the mm, choice making landscape of a cognitive agent. So let's go with a mobster. Yeah. Effectively, what's happening when we refer to the notion of disconnection or separation is we're, we're reducing the scope of self that is actually in, in the context of making choices. What, what had been a larger self, a, a greater being, is now made up of a very uh, field of smaller selves that are making choices on the basis of a much smaller scope of capacity, which is their uh. oriented towards local optima. Because they're orienting towards local optima, they're in fact degrading the landscape that had included a global optima. Right. It's the right. Whole, wholeness of the autopoetic beingness. Right. But because they, these are in fact functional cognitive agents, there's a substantial amount of activity that's going on that looks, in fact, and in fact is cognition, right? So they're, they're, yes. they're shaping the landscape in a potent way. So really looking closely at what's going on inside that gap gives us a lot of insight. In fact, by the way, it may be like a, a 10,000 year long thermodynamic process that mm -hmm. is constantly eating up the, the feedstock that emerges in the context of ordinary human uh, how humans come together into wholeness 
and what is possible in the context of humanness as a, a source for parasitic process. And every time that source comes together, and endeavors to reach a, a more whole basis, it actually provides a niche for this parasitic process. This goes back to your demons, I think. Mm -hmm. I, that's brilliant. So that you, I, I, if I hear you right, you're proposing that the demonic is actually a case where there's a degradation of the hyperagency into parasitic processing, and we can understand parasitic processing in terms of how it's undermining the cognition of the individual agents. Did I understand you correctly? Certainly a piece of it, yes. Well, well if I'm missing an important piece, please, say, please tell me. Uh, something along the lines of the, um, hmm, how do we say this? The notion of tornado. So yeah. the idea of there being a, an eddy or a standing wave or a um, strictly causal dynamic that provides a niche where this degradation process holds the relationship in kind of a medium. Um, right. Yeah. There's a, uh, hmm, how do we say this? This is, I haven't quite got it. Like I can almost feel it, but there's something at the level of the top down that has to, do, and then the level of the bottom up and then the relationship that feels like it's all part of the context. Well, let me, let me try. Maybe something that was mi missing out of what I just said that I'm now hearing you say is you were talking about like, there's something like in, in right? My point was the aggregor is completely bottom up. Right. That's what I was arguing. And then we've got the demonic. And what I heard you saying is the demonic is now a disproportionate relationship between the top down and the bottom up in which the balance that is found within the hyper agent is being lost because, right, the top down is now in a self-destructive process of undermining the individual cognition of the of the component people. That's what I so that's what I heard you saying. Like, like there's a top down Right. Instead of the balance between the top down and the bottom up, there's a, there's a misalignment and the top down is now imposing and infecting the lower processes. So, so the idea would be something like, let's say the system or the hyper agent is trying to be too uh, is trying to to fill up too much space It's not leaving enough because you need a little messiness yes. on the edge for things to, to, to work. And so if you if you're they're not careful, it will create it or give the opportunity for these give reason for these parasitic processes to kind of, to, to kind of appear. And, and, uh, but I'm not, I don't see, I can kind of see it. I can see it. I can see it mythologically. <laughs> Sorry. This is my problem. like, I think in storage. So I can see it mythologically, which is that a, a good example is, you know, in, um, in the Bible, there are these laws about how to till your field yeah. and you till your field, but you have to leave the corner of the field untilled mm -hmm. and you have to leave that for the stranger. So you have to leave it for the processes that aren't part of your hyper agent. You could say you kind of have to leave a little bit of room on the edge for, for a buffer between, but if you're not careful with those corners, they can, they can start to impose themselves. If you try to till them too much, then they revet, they, they come back like a revenge. They come back like a, but it, and if you, if you, if you leave them too big, then they also kind of, they, they tend to want to eat your system. I don't know if that makes sense. Like you have to be careful because there's yeah. no system, no hyper agent can fill up all of its, like the world isn't, the world has all this chaos on the edge. So you can't fill up the world with the system. It will always leave a remainder. So, so, so the, the, the way that's coming to mind, first of all, what came to mind is Kafka, precisely because what happens in the bureaucracy is it becomes a parasitic process that drains sovereignty and individual cognition away. That's the horror of the Kafka of the Kafka ass, right? That the, there's been the, 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 like, so bureaucracies are, this is Max Weber, they're supposed to be bottom up error signal and then top down prediction, right? Sort of mimicking uh, aspects of, but what happens, right? Is you get the bureaucracy just being the top down discharging of blame and not any up, upward tick of error correction. And you get the, you get the horror, right? Because the, the line of communication has just become unidirectional. And yeah, and, I, and, a, and a bureaucracy that's too strong will yes. produce corruption. It will yes. necessarily produce corruption. That's how it, that's what happens in a bureaucracy that is too, that is too pervasive. Exactly, exactly. And, and so uh, what, what it comes to mind is, is Carse's idea where, where the, the hyper agent is oriented towards the infinite game, right? Whereas the parasitic process is engaged in, in, a, in a finite kind of game. 
because what it's trying to do, right, is get some sort of final closure, right? Because it, because it's, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling here. Because, because it's parasitic, because it's self-destructive, it can't be an infinite game player. Do you get what I'm trying to get at? It, it can't, whereas leaving the corners of the field is that there's going to be stuff beyond the game and we're going to have to, one of the things we have to do as we play the game is change the rules by how which we play the game because it will be the stranger, right? That's ah. the infinite game, right? But the finite game says, no, 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 that's the top-down bureaucracy. We can encompass this completely. And, and when you look at parasitic processing within individuals, what, what's typically happening is, is that is, is reciprocal narrowing until they get to like, it can't be any other way than this. It can't be any other way than this. Sorry, I'm just trying to like rock what you said, but I got a, I got a powerful sense of, right, that there, there's an inability of a parasitic processing the demonic. I mean, but this, this is, you know this, Jonathan, this is like Dionysus, evil is ultimately totally parasitic on the good, right? It, 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 it pretends to help its self-existence, but it can't actually play the infinite game. So you, but if you think, think of it like in a person in terms of, uh, let's say a fast binge pattern, right? Where someone is on a diet, a diet binge pattern, where someone tries to make, create a top-down pattern yeah. of being in themselves, where they're, they're like, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do this and do that. And they make it so strict that the opposite happens because a parasitic process sets itself up. Then you find yourself at two in the morning eating a tub of ice cream. And it's like, that is, and you know, it's destroying you, but it's like, there's something else taking over your will. Right. Yeah. Because what's happened is instead of a dynamic, right, between bottom up and top down, you're getting a vacillation. You get the top down, uh, right, the, the Kafka-esque, and then you get the bottom up explosion of impulsivity. That's the binging. I lose all agency. And then I, right. And, and, and you, you're getting that going back. And that's typically what's happening in parasitic processing. Hmm. So it comes up for me there. And I'm, so no, I'm noticing two things. One is, I, how do I say this right? Symbolically, I heard John reference the notion of changing the game. Mm -hmm. And so land, that landed for me was perhaps a orientation or an invitation to shift the game that we're engaging in. Uh, and I noticed that I felt something, hmm, how do I say, strong, perhaps, or certain clarity when Jonathan was orienting us in the direction of the mythological. Mm. So part of the invitation, I would say, is to shift more into a mythological, poetic, artistic, hmm, religious, mystic, mystic, mystic mode. Uh, okay, the other one that came up as I was myself doing that was I was, I, the word golem came in. Mm. Yeah. And it spoke to something like um, there's a kind of part in humans, we might call this the mind or the ego that has as one of its characteristics, both a, uh, a capacity and in some sense, a pro propensity to take itself as the whole. So this is that, mm -hmm. that thing where you don't actually have relationship with, with proper relationship with wholeness. And I'm wondering if this is that, that, that delicate balance of the, the four cornered field. Um, you know, the, the, the Scylla and Charybdis on either side of that very delicate balance. Um, but actually, it takes itself and presents itself as representing the whole, but in fact, it certainly can't. And this is what gets you in real trouble. Like that's the, that feels like the two, two sides of the coin. Like one side of the coin is the, the real actuality of the lived delicate balance of relationship with the actual lived whole. And particular... I'm not sure if this is a commonplace thing. I think it may, it may in fact be a precisely human thing, but we'll see the, the challenge or the risk of a particular aspect of human holes. Again, I'll say things like mind and ego that, that will endeavor to present themselves as in fact, actually being a whole um, and therefore get in the way. Right. And this is that sort of mob problem of the demonic capacity, something like that. So there's a bunch of things there that maybe can, we can play with. Well, there's definitely, let's say, in the image of the demonic hierarchy, you have the devil as being, as pride being the sin of the devil. That is definitely, that is there. The idea is that what the what the the devil says is, I am, I am God, right? I I am God, and so it comes into conflict with the whole because he wants to be the totality of all things in in, in himself, let's say, and not participate in something bigger than him, and that is what leads to. The, 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 the two. So in terms of what we're talking about, in terms of the flip, 
between one side and the other. Saint Maximus, the confessor, talks about talks about sins of the right hand and sins of the left hand, and he says the first sin is always the sin of the right hand. That is, it's pride, self sufficiency, all of these types of sins, and then those secretly lead to sins of the left hand, which are you know passions falling apart. You know, you know all these thoughts that you can't control, and, and so you have this this movement from one to the other. But it is rooted in the the idea of not let's say a being not participating in a greater whole but wanting to just exist as itself like as, as this kind of self perpetuating thing so so that i think this is a good move because participating like what's the participatory relationship right and so you know levin s makes the famous distinction between totality which is what the bureaucracy is trying to do or what the passion is trying to do also and infinity and they right, and so the totality is the idea that this can be this can be grasped, this can be closed upon, right? Whereas the living thing is the it has the proper relationship to infinity in the sense that the living thing has a capacity for evolution that the parasitic processing thing doesn't have, right? Uh, like this this is the sense I'm getting, in fact, from Maximus. I'm reading him right mm-hmm. now. If you if if, if I'll use mythological language as Jordan invited us. If God was to completely remove, he can't, I get it. But if he were, right, and the demons were allowed to run completely free, they would disappear in an instant, right? Because they would reciprocally narrow to nothing. They mm-hmm. don't actually, they do not have a capacity. In fact, the defining feature of them, I would put it to you, is they're incapable of evolution. They're incapable of, right, th- that movement that is constitutive of life which is the participation in infinity without ever claiming to have a totality. And so the thing I see in the mob is exactly that feature, right? It may be self-perpetuating, and so therefore it's different than the, the pure egregore, but it can't evolve. Or I would put it this way, if it starts to evolve, it precisely ceases being a mob and becomes a proper hyper agent. So right. right, and just just to hold that little piece right there is that there's a um, hmm. just to, that thing I brought in earlier about the fact that we don't want to be confused. So the mob, right. uh, we have a very very nice term actually. There's the distinction between evolution and development. Yes, yes. Development is is the exploration of a potential that is already present in a closed domain. Yes, yes. So so the mob in fact can develop, meaning it, it has a period of time whereby it can in fact expose a novelty that was already imparted into the reality that it was that it was at the moment of its being. Yes. Without actually being connected to a wholeness and therefore is incapable of evolution, right? Yes. So yes. Novelty. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, 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 Jonathan, this I, doesn't this resonate? I mean, at least in some deep ways. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm doing Lexio Divina on both Dionysus and Maximus right now. Mm-hmm. And that's right, and I'm both and I have sections both where they're wrestling with right, the the existence of evil, and they're both making the argument that, you know, evil is kind of pure self-destructiveness. And and like, like Jordan says, it has a capacity for development, uh, because it's not completely self-existent, although it pretends to be. Yeah. Right. But if it was, if it was completely unconstrained by the love of God, yeah, it it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it it, 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 it would actually, like, completely self-destruct. It, it, like, I don't think I'm imposing that on them when I'm saying No, no, that. no. I think you're right. Yeah. So a good, I think, so the way that I like to, to think about it, at least, so would be something like the constitutive elements of, a, of an egregore, let's say. They're, they're these parasitic patterns, parasitic structures, but they have, they have the, they could have the possibility of being more than what they are. It's just that they aren't. They, they, they're, they're, they're self they're looking yeah. at themselves and it's it's called a devolving because of that. So so an addiction is a good example. So every yes. addiction is based on a true desire, which could lead you into something more, but because it closes itself off and then then yes. acts as this weird self-existent being, then it then it becomes parasitical and tends to destroy the higher agent. So yeah. now we have to bring in the notion of selling your soul. <laughs> right? yeah. so the addiction captures the actual vitality of a living being yes and it it enslaves it whips right it drives that living being it actually will extinguish it but in the meantime it will actually 
tap into whatever degree of evolution that living being actually still has left in it. Uh, yeah. So if you imagine sort of your classic, let's go with Jim Morrison, somebody who I have a uh, sort of a connection with, you know, a vital genius connected to wholeness in a particular way and ridden by a demon that pushed the being into a self-destructive ex- uh, like a local yeah. optima ex- extraction of what was available in terms of a short-term burning brightness that generated a, an energetic flow of, of capacity that was extracted by the demon until, of course, the underlying host died, at which point the demon also evaporates, or in this case, has to find a new, a new host. Find a new host. Yeah. Um, and many of us may, in fact, be associated with that. So there's a very interesting, that's a, now we're getting to a very interesting place to begin exploring what that looks like. Um, but I think you're right. The idea of selling your soul is that's exactly what it is. It's like, I mean, you could say that every time that you see a good in itself or that you try to attach yourself to a good in itself that isn't leading you to better, higher goods, that isn't, that isn't placing you in a system of higher goods, let's say, then you are somewhat selling your soul or you're letting your soul be captured by something which will feed off of it. Anything, anytime you, you profane the sacred, you're selling your soul. Yeah. And so you can understand, like, it's a, a country, for example, could have that, that problem where they get caught up in one specific aspect of what it is to be a country. And then they, they, mm-hmm. they kind of revolve around that. And then it captures the soul of the, of the country. So, and then it ends up, it can end up just devouring it. You, I think you saw that in, in communist countries. Um, and I think you probably see it now. Let's say in America, you can see how entertainment has become, let's say, this massive, weird, parasitic thing that is, that is devouring everybody's attention uh, and is in some way blinding them to higher goods in which they can participate. It's kind of capturing the soul of, a, of even a country. Uh, and there are different forms of that, I think. So, so is the demonic in this sense, uh, the, the, sorry, I, I, I will, you, you two can keep exploring the mythological, I'll try and play that game, but I keep coming back to the biological. Maybe we're trying to actually get uh, bios and mythos and logos to talk to each other here. Um, but um, like I, the, the metaphor that's coming to mind for these kinds of things is like a, like a virus, like that, right? Um, a, 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 as, right. Um, like the, I, I'm try, all the viruses can evolve. So that's where the analogy breaks down. But I'm trying to get almost something like a computer virus is what I want um, that can infect and spread and replicate, uh, but it's completely dependent, asymmetrically, de- it's asymmetrically dependent, but it can't ever become a bona fide, you know, uh, program that does anything useful in the world. Um, I, I'm trying to get at, right, the reason I bring it up is because it's a, there's a real debate, and I don't mean like just academics doing their typical hair splitting. There's a real debate about whether or not viruses have agency. Hmm. That's why I'm bringing up that as the analogy, because they, they it, it, and there's a real debate about whether or not they're actually alive, mm-hmm. precisely because they, they're sitting on that boundary, right? Uh, right between, right? Uh, they sit right on this gray line between uh, agency and non-agency and between living and non-living. And, and, and I, I feel like we're wrestling with a deeply analogous problem with the, the, the demonic or whatever we want to call <laughs> this, this meddling thing is, right? Is, is it perhaps also that, because for me, the notion of hyper-agency, I think is very well developed. And I think the notion of aggregation is very well developed. You can, you know, cybernetic systems, et cetera, et cetera, right? But this intermediary thing, it seems like it's difficult for us precisely because it's falling between the right, the living and the non-living, the agentic and the non-agentic, like a virus, mm-hmm. and, right? And, 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 and I'm just wondering if, if we're struggling because we are, we are bringing categories to bear on it that it definitionally eludes, right? Uh, do you, do, do, like I'm just, like no, I'm, I think I think I think you're right, but I think that your understanding of in between is yeah. extremely important. Right. And if I if I bring about the image of the chimera, like the way that the chimera yes. is represented, the demon is represented as a chimera, 
And so this is the in-between space. This is the problem of the in-between space, the problem right. of transitions, right? All this, all this issue. And so I think that this is what the virus represents. You, by the way, John, you know that Jacques Derrida in a famous interview said that everything that he's ever done is about a virus. Everything that he's ever done yeah. is, is about virology because exactly of that point, which yes. is that the yeah. virus is, yeah, is exactly. a mal vivant. The virus is a living dead it's like a zombie in a way, yes, like yes. this in between character. Yes. Because we, and then when we focus on it, it it tends to deconstruct the the the, the identities. It tends to actually kind yeah, of devour yes. Yes. parasitically the different yes. identities <laughs> that it's attached to. Yes, yes, I had forgotten that, but I, I thank you for reminding me. I was thinking of uh, uh, Burroughs that language is a virus from outer space. Um, I was thinking, of, which was, I guess, is very Derridian also. But thank you for that. Yeah, that that I I do knew I did know that, but I had forgotten that. That's a fantastic uh, remembering. Yes, um, there is. So I think that one of the reasons why we're seeing this now is that on the one hand we have a system, let's say, a system of control that control of information, which is the internet, which is also the states, the states moving into things like digital identity and yes, digital control. Yes, yes. So we have these systems happening. So we can notice this, this top-down thing that is coming down strong. But at the yeah. same time, we also have this deconstructive mode in the culture, this yes. idea of, of destroying, mm -hmm. of breaking down identities of, of, of these parasitic behaviors. And so I think that it's those two extremes happening at the same time are probably possibly the thing that is making people able to perceive these hyper agents again, which because they're, you can see they're, they're, they're pressing down on us. We can kind of see it, it happening in a way that, you know, cause you think like who controls Twitter, for example, it's like, well, no one actually controls Twitter. Right. They, they get taken up by these ideological things that come back down, but it's like, you couldn't point to one person and say this, this person controls, let's say the, the narrative right now it's, it's happening organically for sure. But, but that was always the case, to, yeah. to, to, to my point. Language is a virus from outer space. That was always the case for language. Nobody controls it. Nobody runs it. There's nobody in charge of it yet. But it evolves and it changes and it has a life of its own in powerful ways. We are all asymmetrically dependent on the languages that we know, right, in powerful ways. Um, I, think, I think the point that Jonathan's making is something like because we're in a moment where a whole category of hyperagents are in the process of dying inelegantly. Um, it's <laughs> easier to notice that that's what's happening. Right? The, the sort of the, 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 the bunny is no longer just sort of a no longer, uh, maybe it's, it's no longer maybe sleeping, right? The rot has set in quite significantly. There's a sort of certain stench and a certain uh, awareness that if you touched it, maybe something bad would happen to you, right? You don't want to eat it anymore. It's definitely not a healthy thing to be connected with. Simultaneously, the kind of the, the game is afoot to see what new kinds of hyperagents might want to step in and integrate us so neatly into their body. Um, and so both, you know, the, the sort of decaying dead body of the hyperagents of the past, um, sort of collapsing Titanic-like into the ocean and maybe pulling us down with them is present very viscerally. Um, as are all the various kinds of the, the previous simplicities of the ways that you would go about solving basic problems in life, like going to the grocery store are no longer obvious and simple. And so shit's fucked up and you have to think about it. Oh shit, I have to think about it. What's happening? Oh, and it kind of pushes the mind into a greater and greater awareness of what's happening. And because this novelty is there, there's both a, an awareness of the, of the moment of geez, if we don't make some of us, if we don't make choices in a certain direction, then we will be brought into a new kind of thing, uh, probably kicking and screaming. Um, and also, well, now's the time. Right? If, if we would like to have something be slightly different, you couldn't have done it in 1977. There was no chance of that. But now you can because the space of transition is upon us, that kind of thing. So I think those are bringing into the surface this awareness and the mythopoetic is activating it within us. Say, hey, guys, this is sort of one of those times. I agree with that. I think that's a good point. So thank you for that. I guess I would want to say I would that the point I was trying to bring out, I think, is then needs to be brought into proper relation, which is I, I wanted to indicate that it has always been the case that there have been things that nobody's in charge of language, culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and that we we have lost a cognitive cultural grammar in order to talk about them. 
that is also part of the problem. I agree with you, Jordan, you know I do, that we are now in a time of accelerating rate of complexification. Um, I, 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 I like this almost mythological idea of hyper agents becoming zombies, right? This is a term actually used of certain distributed cognitive systems, right? Like the, the, the zombies in between, the, the, the viral entities, um, and, and they're infecting us and that makes us aware of them. But I, I also think we've lost a way of talking and thinking and, and conceiving of uh, the hyper agents uh, that is also part of the problem. Um, that, and, and, right? Um, I think it, that for many people, and this is no backhanded criticism to Jonathan, who I consider an important friend, right? But for many people, they are not willing to take up the ancient language, the ancient languages. That's I keep coming back to language as a metaphor here. The ancient languages by which these hyper agents were properly related to, um, and, uh, and and lived with, if I can put, and lived through. And so I I, I don't deny everything you said. I, I, I that there, there's something happening here, but I also think there there is also an impoverishment on on our side of our capacity to enter into a proper receptivity of these entities that is also making um, everything much worse. <laughs> Sorry, that, that ended up very Yeah, well. if I wanted to monopolize the game of hyper-agency, then I would impoverish the language of humanity. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and there's also something which I think is happening, which is, which is also part of this, which is that as we notice I mean, let's be honest, like as we watch Christianity die, let's say, yeah. one of the things that's happening is that there it's leave it's giving the space for these competing hyper agents to appear, like Jordan was talking about. Basically, you have all these these beings rushing in and now fighting amongst each other to figure out who's going to take over. Um, that, aren't they all often just zombie Christianities? Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what I think that what I was coming to is the idea of Antichrist. Like, I, I yeah. think that this is something it seems like Christians had perceived at the outset, that the idea that in the moment of its death or in the moment that Christianity would 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 fall apart, like there would be this spirit of Antichrist, which would appear, which would be a strange remainder, a strange parasitic version of, uh. of Christianity that would that would appear and would kind of take over the space. And so even if you look at the like weird neo-pagan type things that are coming in, they're all framed as strangely anti-Christian at the same time, you know? So you, at least in the West, for sure. I mean, I don't know about in, in another place, but in the West, this is what seems to be happening. But then now the, the thing is that now these small little beings are appearing and manifesting themselves and people are noticing them. And the fact that a lot of people haven't noticed these beings before, let's say, means that now they're fascinated by them. Like they're fascinated by them. Like I, even like, I think the whole psychedelic thing, a lot of it has to do with that. It's like people, they, they, they take these psychedelics, they encounter these intelligences and they become fascinated no matter what it is that they encounter. They have no way to, they don't discern these beings that they're encountering. They just encounter them. And there, there seems to be something of that going on, which is like, if I can have a, you know, people join these little weird subcultural groups and become extremely passionate about, about it because they are looking for hyper agency. They're looking for ways to participate in, in common stories and in common, but there's no, there is, there is no, there is no way for it to, they all appear as these parasitic things and they're all devouring people's attention. And, you know, whether it be like Star Wars, Jedi culture or, or crazy, you know, a political activism, like all of it is the same. It's like these little per parasitic processes that are taking up people's attention and driving them towards separation, at least like uh, social yeah. division, for sure. We should throw Baudrillard into the mix. We, we brought his buddy Jacques in. We might as well bring in Baudrillard. Um, you know, we're talking about simulations. Uh, simulations and simulacra, right? Yeah. Uh, but I would, I would like to point out maybe two things to help uh, expand. One is... Yeah, I'll say it. it's actually two parts of the same thing. Uh, I don't know that we we are, are are really properly in relationship with 
the degree to which humans have been living in these sort of dead, decaying, um, no longer wholesome contexts. I, I would say something like, and I'm going to make this proposal. Right. I would say something like 98%, 95, 85% of all of history has been the history of human beings being in this game of being like in the mob, meaning the, the thing, they are not living a living whole being system. They are in fact participating in the development, the exploration of the sort of uh, except extraction of the decaying body of something that they are part of, which lasts hundreds or thousands of years at an arc. Um, so we've been living in a period of momentary eruptions of, hmm, I think, guess the word probably is properly spirit in some very specific sense which then provides a, a temporary, of course, in a human arc, hundreds of years or thousands of years, temporary sort of body to be slowly decayed. Um, and that as a consequence, we actually get very confused, right? We, we, we mistake the game of playing mob, mobster, for the game of actually being in connection with wholesome reality. Um, because our metaphors and our references are still pulling examples of the same fucking thing, just maybe at a larger scope or a different period of its death. And here I'll, here I'll call out specifically two guys who I, I've, I've got a lot of reference to. One is Carol Quigley, and another is Peter Turchin, uh, who talk about the rise and fall of civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Quigley, I think, did the best job because of the period of time when he was writing, which was, uh, you know, when a civilization is born, let's go with Rome on the, on the Palatine Hills, just barely pushing back against a, uh, the, the Celtic uh, invasion, there's a... a, a a point at which a certain kind of, let's say codes or generator function, uh, a moment of evolution occurs in, in a period of absolute uh, crisis. This then creates what he called the expansive principle that once that is born, there's almost like the whole story of Rome for a thousand years is locked in at that point. You have this arc through which it, it deploys, it develops, it explores the space that is born more or less in a, in a, in a generation. And it expands to the degree to which that expansive principle gives it power, the ability to extract power and concentrate it on itself. It just expands. And of course, it explores the edges and the fringes because it's using human beings as cognitive agents. And it becomes a sort of demonic principle expanding on the backs of those who are brought in more and more and more into the body of Rome. I'm noticing that as a really interesting metaphor or a mythopoetic Babylon, right? But it's already dead. Right? There's a point at which it will appear. By the way, Quigley very specifically says, when you think you're in a golden age, you're actually at the point at which you're eating the seed, right? That, that you're consuming the last vital energy. And then by the time you realize you're in the decline, the civilization is actually passed into the point of its, of, its, of its inevitable death. It just may take a while, depending on how much it can continue to consume, right? How much can it eat? You know, how much energy was contained within the reservoir that it, it, that it staked? And so, you know, if we imagine that that's the story, right? That it's only actually at the edges, right? It's only in moments of true gathering, right? When, 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 geez, when spirit is present, that the upwelling comes. But for the most part, for the whole of civilization, we've actually been living in dead things. And we've built the mindset of parasitism so deeply into our grammar, into our sensibilities, that we're going to have to be extremely careful not to take a simulation of something that seems like a really good copy of the real thing as the real thing. So you've, you've, you've got a version of the fall to speak uh, mythologically. Um, mm. that, yes, so. Right. Um, so, but the thing, the question is, so, so Jordan Peterson, his, his, the way that he talks about it, he says, he says something like, you're right. That's how it works. But the only way to do it is to go down into the belly of the whale and resurrect your father. Like, because the problem with the way you're saying, the way that you're saying it is that you can't manufacture the Kairos moment that will cause the monumental change. You can't manufacture the moment of expansion. You, you can't make it up. It's something which kind of, which happens in a, in a, in a, in a revelation, you could say. And so until that revelation happens, it seems like even though maybe what you're saying is right, the only thing to do 
is to try to breathe life into the the forms that have been given to you because or else what or else, yeah, or right. else i disagree or else but or else you have all these like 60s like cults like you have all these weird uh, like you have all these like little definitely like, a bad idea you know so so what what else then all right you ready this yeah is, go for it jordan it, this is fresh or not fresh it's, it's ancient um so i was really thinking about this after reading that essay um that was the, the sort of the precursor of this conversation yeah. and i was uh sort of sitting with you know what my Peggio's point of view on um, the top down emanation i believe is the term you use yeah um hmm. And the, the thing that kept coming up for me was a question of creation and the notion of the moment of creation. And I couldn't help but continually find myself in a circumstance where I was finding, uh, taking the perspective, it just showed up for me as obvious, that the moment of creation is omnipresent. It is, it is not operating in what would be chronos, right? It's not operating in, in sort of time as we understand it in that mm-hmm. fashion. Yeah. And so the, the possibility of Kairos is always present. One does not manufacture Kairos by any stretch of the imagination, but one becomes afforded to the possibility of per- perceiving and playing with the Kairos that is always present for what it is, where what it is, right? And that is sort of the beginning and the end of the story. So you definitely don't try to create a fucking cult, right? But beyond comprehension, a terrible idea. Yeah. But simply dancing with the presence of the Kairos that is always present is the only ethical, only proper thing to do anyway. No, but I, I, I agree with you. That is, I agree in the sense that I agree that, so the way that I would say say it is that the only thing you can do is become a saint. Like that's actually the only thing you can do. The only thing you can do is transform your passions, transform yourself, transform your your life and that then you will become in a way what is it christ says you know become become a tree and then the bird will land in your branches but you that has to that has to happen and so uh and so i agree but there are different levels of that like there are different levels of of kairos let's say there 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 are different there i can play that role but i'm not going to start a new religion right i can play that role within the story that has been given to me. And I'm not going, so even let's say, even if you take, for example, Christ, he's not making a new thing up. You know, what he's doing is he is, he is coming into the Judaic tradition. And then, you know, if you believe what he was and what he said, he's basically breathing life back into it and showing us the brightness of what was there, like kind of giving life to something which was, which was given to him. And so I think that that's the only thing we can do at each of our levels. Like, I think it's the same even with Buddha. Like Buddha didn't, didn't make something up. Like he was coming into an ascetic tradition. He looked, he looked at the different ascetics and he gathered that in. And then he, he transformed it or represented it in a way which was, which was full, let's say. Um, well, I, I want to respond to that. I mean, Christianity isn't Judaism and Buddhism isn't Hinduism. Right there, right. So there is something that's going on there. I I, I agree with you. The, we shouldn't be making uh, a religion. Um, but I'm I, I'm I'm wondering about like part of Morton's point about hyper objects is that they force us into a kairos, right? Like I I I do think the kairos is upon us. Uh, and I thought both of you were saying that earlier. There's a sense in which this we know that something is changing here because all of these entities are now the 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 plausibility of the existence of these entities is now prominent where it was not 20 or even 15 years ago. That seems to me to be an important marker about the fundamental levels of our ontology. So I do think the Kairos is upon us. But we're not going to direct it. Like I don't think but, that, no, that no, we can't. Going to. <laughs> We, but but I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I'm not trying to direct it. That yeah. that is that is exactly to confuse. That is exactly to think it's all top down. Neither are we just supposed to passively wait. That's just no. purely bottom up. We have to figure out the proper proportional participation, and that's what I mean by right. I don't know if we have the language for that right now for the concepts of it. So one of the things we can do is yeah, I agree with you, you like Jordan, I, I don't disagree with, you know, we've been playing the, the, the sort of, 
you know, the, 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 the extraction model of civilization, and we can't do that anymore. Uh, we're at another Kairos, which is we're global, uh, and right, we, we, can't, we can't just have an extraction mentality. So two things are, are pushing on us, right? We have the advent of the reality of the parasitic entities and the hyper agents. And we have the fact that civilization now encompasses the globe, which it never had before. And so there's no outside. We can't extract and move on. We can't wait, right? And so for me, um, like, I, 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 wanna, I wanna sort of bring it back around to what is it for us to enter into proper relationship with Mm. these hyper agents and these parasitic agents such right because i mean i thought that uh, there's a biblical truth here i thought yes we don't direct the kairos but our decisions matter to the kairos no, right sure. yeah. right and, and so how can we how can we virtuously and with virtuosity participate in the largely virtual medium in which the kairos is presenting itself so that we can discover the proper relationship to the, the emerging ontology, if I can put it that way. That to me is the question. Like I, I, I am interested as a scientist in all of these ontological questions, uh, but what, what, what comes back to me is, yeah, but what's, and I think this is what Jordan is saying. There's, there, there, and I think maybe you're saying it too, Jonathan. We're, we're at a Kairos, the Kairos is upon us. Right, we're, we're, and and yes, and I get it. The historical Kairos is situated against the eternal Kairos, but, but that's exactly just to put the question: is how do I enter into a proper relationship to this emerging ontology, so that I can have some trust that I'm being virtuous in relationship to it? I mean, the problem with by moment, I mean, now going to dynamical systems. When they're in criticality, they, right, small differences matter in the way that they never mattered before. Mm -hmm. Very small differences. Like when, when civilization is sort of rumbling along, along, the chances that what anything you or I do can make any difference are very small. But when a system becomes hypercritical, like it is now, in both senses of the word, by the way, right, small differences can make, small actions can have huge differences. So I feel a tremendous responsibility. And the question that comes from me is, Okay, but how can I exercise virtuosity grounded in virtue about this? Because for me, Jordan, that's the way of stepping out of the all too human repetition of the, the extractor function of civilization and trying to get to something more primordial. Hmm. So there's a, there's a lot that just happened there, a number of different things. So let's see. One, I would say, uh, the first thing that popped out very sharply for me was this, this phrase, did not make something up. Mm -hmm. And I think this is quite important to really focus on that. Um, that phrase, like to make something up, it, 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 for me, it, it speaks to that notion of golem, right? It speaks to that notion of simulation. Uh, to be sure, he did not make something up. Uh, and I would say even more powerfully, to make something up, is precisely this mistake of mind taking itself to be the whole. So category error, don't do that ever, bad idea. Um, and so then it's like, what does it mean to, to simply be kind of making choices or to, to act in right relationship with the Kairos? In some sense, that's all there is to it. Uh, so that's all we're talking about. What does it mean to simply make proper choices in the context of <laughs> making proper choices? Um, and so, you know, the, to, to express the logos with humility and integrity is very different than to make something up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like yes. quite, quite the, I would say opposite, but not even the word opposite. It's not the proper, it creates the wrong frame. It's not mm -hmm. the word opposite isn't, isn't even part of the story. Um, Hmm. And, and, you know, if we think about the, <laughs> if we think about the magnitude of the notion of creation itself in relationship with the epiphenomenon of human civilization, 
uh, that which is possible in the context of simply expressing the logos properly in Kairos uh, is not a historical event. <laughs> we can't sort of measure it against historical events. That's nonsense. It's like saying you can't stack two grains of sand upon the other. Um, uh, all that has happened in the long arc of human history is as nothing in relationship to the potential that is embedded in the creation itself. So to the degree to which even a small number of people come to a capacity to, to speak the logos or express the logos with integrity and humility, then we literally have no possibility of understanding exactly what might follow, nor should we endeavor to do so. Mm -hmm. Ours is not to understand it. Ours is simply to endeavor to do it as well as we can. Um, again, with tremendous humility. Um, so that's the, the, what came for me as a, in, in response to that, that last little bit. I think, I think, I mean, I think your point is very powerful. And I think that it talks about this idea too of the seed, you know, this image, for example, of, of the ark is a, is a good one because you would think, you know, the ark, Noah's ark is just this little dot in an ocean of, of breakdown and chaos and everything falling apart, but that's it. Like that's, that's it. That's all we can do is to, let's say manifest the seed and then that will grow, you know, with, with time as the, as the, the shift happens, then, then it's, it really is in a way, the only thing we can do. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I, I get that, but I still want to press the Socratic point which is the virtuosity and virtue of the logos in relationship to the hyper agents. These are virtues and virtuosities that we are not properly explicating and cultivating right now mm -hmm. in our culture, right? If, if putting this, the, the, like, here's the emerging ontology. This is reality saying, I'm going to break into everything you thought you made. That's what's happening, right? That's what the hyper objects and the parasitic entities are doing. And I like this idea that they're degradations of the hyper agents, the in-between. I think that's beautiful. But then, okay, how do I, how do I not exercise this wrong word? How do I participate in the virtuosity and virtue of logos with these aspects of my ontology, given that they are eruptions into what, uh, what, what has been a, a stable ontology. The ontology is being destabilized, right? It's entering, right? And so, I, you know, this comes up, it comes up for me in my practices. Yeah. Right. Like how, what is it like in, in or what is it like to exercise? I keep saying exercise to practice. That's the word I want to practice the participation mm. of the virtuosity and the virtues of logos with respect to the emerging aspects of the ontology. Mm. Right? That to me, it, it, and it, like I say, this is not an abstract problem. This comes up for me in Lexio Divina. This comes up for me in philosophical fellowship. This comes up for me in dialectic into dialogos. And that's what I think we, I, I want. Like I, 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 I'm like sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm getting too passionate. But that's the part that I really want to bring into right in, into prominence. Uh, we have a kind of you might not agree with me on this, Jonathan, but to my mind, it looks like we have a profound ignorance about this. And first of all, we have to admit the ignorance. That's Socrates. And then secondly, what, how are we going to respond to it? How are we going to respond? Like, I, 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 I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think that the, the surprise is maybe that there's a, in this world of kind of breakdown what one of the problems that happens is that the person who's trying to humbly express logos will appear as a thorn at first. Mm. And then, and then might, might not make it. I don't know what to say. Like might not make it, you know, <laughs> might just be there to plant the seed and might not make it into the, into the Holy land. Well you know? said. Well said. Oh well yeah. Said. Yeah. Well, yeah. Said. well said. I would say that this is, this is a very, hmm, how would I say Yes. In fact, it seems quite likely that making it to the Holy Land is not part of the, not part of the gig. Not part of the plan. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this is another, okay. I, I think I feel that what, what was happening earlier more clearly. Um, okay. Not make something up. Yes. 
which is to say something like, what is? What is real? Being in relationship with what is real, right? One is not creating, one is not the creator. One is being in relationship with what is real and one is allowing the creation to flow through. Mm -hmm. um, hold on. So there's maybe two or three, there's several moves that come up that seem to be proper. Uh, one, which is clearly incredibly challenging, is, is merely perceiving reality for what it is. Um, uh, okay, yeah, so where I wanna go with that, and I, I'll say a little bit more, but I wanna hold this because this is what feels like the most meaningful at this moment is the, the nature of reality, which is transcendent, which is to say that there is a, uh, this is very much connected to Jonathan. I think some of the things that were in that essay, uh, Jesus, not words, yeah, that which is, is not that which we can say. Uh, and yet it is not without order, right? There is a, a sort of a necessity or a proper order to being, which is intrinsic to being and that we can discern. And mm -hmm. this of course is hmm, invariant under transformation to use a, a contemporary geometric language and provides a ground against which we can orient our choices uh, in regardless of the fact of con chaos in the larger sort of actual uh, human context. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big piece. Um, maybe it's the only piece. The other you're, one, you're, you're right. You're so right. Because but it also, one of the things that happens when you orient yourself properly in a world of chaos is that it really does, it, it shines brighter actually probably than in a world where all things are, are going their own way. And Quite. so, you know, and so it actually can really act as a transformative agent for good and ill. Like people will hate you and then some people will love you, but the, it, it can't, you know, if you're, if you're, I mean, a good example would be that if you're in a corrupt world and you decide you're going to tell the truth, you will have an effect. There's no way around it. They might kill you. They might get rid of you. All of this might happen, but you'll have a transformative effect because that light will shine in the darkness, there's no way around it. Yeah, so John, flipping it to the language of virtue, um, there's two ways of being in relationship with virtue. Um, one, <laughs> something along the lines of sort of a, a conservation law of evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. So you know, an, an adequately large number of blind people sort of feeling around in a, uh, in a maze will find their way through the maze, right? And they may remember it. They may like try to write it down and say, hey, left, right, right, left, left. That's how you get out. Yeah. That's the, the, the human beings living in cultures, surviving and dying and discovering that things like humility and courage and integrity. If you, if you have those woven deeply into the nature of your culture, you're going to be more likely to live well than others. Right. That's sort of that perspective, right. That way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, of course, is that you simply turn on the light and you look at the maze and you notice there's, there's actually a structure to the maze. And there's a way of noticing just how to get through it without having to go through the process of searching, groping with your, with your eyes closed and your hands out. Um, and this is what I was referring to earlier, right? So the proposition is that both of these are accurate. Like both of these are very valid ways. Um, and that there's something like our capacity now, where we are now as, as, as humans, is we can be aware of that. And we can say, okay, there is actually a beautiful, almost like a hint, um, a clue to this thing, virtue, the virtues, that is hard worn. We can look back at the history of history and say, okay, here's where these things have shown up. Here's the edges and the parameters and the shapes of the thing. But now we actually are in a process where we can, and I would say must, turn on the light. And we have to, in fact, become capable of perceiving that and use the, the, the evolutionary process to kind of act as a scaffold and a support, but step to the last, you know, that next step that is available, which is beyond what's available through trial and error, because we haven't got any time left to engage in trial and error. We have to become really significantly virtuous. And the best way to do that is to actually have a much better sense of the nature of what the underlying intrinsic order is that has been constantly rediscovered and rediscovered and rediscovered. Um, and then Jonathan, something that keeps coming up for me, and I think this is very much connected to a stream that I've noticed coming from you, and I'll say it in a, in a very different way because it, it creates a space. Um, I spent a lot of time last year with uh, the Hawaiians. And um, 
They taught me substantially about the validity and importance of restoration um, for them politically, but also from a point of view of lineage, from the point of view of a, a culture that spent a lot of time figuring out how to actually create a way of holding perception of reality and making effective choices uh, well. And as they taught me their language, I discovered that it didn't have a whole lot of the corruptions that the language that I was taught as a child, namely English. Um, so something very powerful also about restoration. And then John, you and I've been spending a lot of time restoring English and in some yes. sense, Greek. Right? <laughs> yes. yes. And rediscovering for me, like as a, as a, just an ordinary kind of secular Western uh, capitalism suburbs kid, what the word faith maybe really means, right? Not, not the seventh order derivative of propaganda faith that has been sort of loosely insulated and in, in integrated into my mind, but what it may actually mean and, and therefore a restoration to its proper place. And so this notion of healing or bringing back into wholesomeness, the restoration of the lineages that are, were developed in integrity in relationship with actual reality and did their living best to build structures that would hold and transmit that capacity to thrive in relationship with reality into the future is a profound, and I would say fundamental move um, and sits to the right hand of simply turning on the light. I, I, I agree with this like profoundly. Um, I, I think what I need to do is bring a, a concrete in um, to like, so I, I was in, involved in a philosophical fellowship practice. And what you do is you, like you, somebody reads a text very slowly and then somebody picks out the re, uh, uh, the first reader usually picks out a phrase, you, you chant the phrase and then you do what's called, pre, you do a kind of speech, uh, precious speaking. Anyways, the point is in this practice, you're not speaking to the text. You're addressing the, pre you're trying to presence the perspective of the author. Mm. So you're trying to actually uh, presence the perspective of the sage so you can enter into conformity uh, to the, the perspective of the sage, not just taking information from their propositions. This is a way of trying to bring about a transformative relationship to texts so that they have a capacity for transformation other than just information. Now, what happens is people, and, and, and this is part of what I teach people to do, they were, we were reading a passage from Simone de Beauvoir. And what starts to happen is other people start to, they start to speak things that you can't think about the text. And they, they, they begin, they start to become the voice of Simone in a way that's hard to explain because you get a sense of, wow, I, that's all there and I didn't see it. And the other people are speaking it and everybody's doing this. And then there's a pivot point, and I did this deliberately and provocatively because I've been doing it in my practice, where people, I, I don't just talk about, you know, the, uh, the, I, I don't just talk third person. I shifted to second person address. And I said, Simone, and a, a couple of, one other person picked it up, Layman picked it up, and he immediately started doing that, right? And, and two other people said they wanted to do that. Hmm. They wanted to do that. They wanted to take an I thou rather than an I it or an I me, which is how all the discourse was going. I it, I me. They wanted to take an I thou and they were choked. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And I said, well, challenging the choke is where I'm finding most of the transformation. And I'm saying, I'm not claiming that I'm sort of, you know, resurrecting Simone de Beauvoir. But I'm also not just talking to her text. I'm trying to do something else, right? And what it is, is for me, what happens is the logos of her text is present and it conveys something that was both universal and particular about her. And I'm trying to address that and trying to, right? And, and the pro, and, and I find, and, and people said it's it's uncanny and it's weird and, and I'm and I'm really you know and there's part of me that's like yeah it's uncanny and it's weird but it's also if I stay behind that choke point I don't get the full impact mm. of the process right there's and I thwart the capacity to internalize 
Simone de Beauvoir uh, about, right? And, 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 and for me, that would be a loss because she has a particular understanding of uh, 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 the female perspective that I think is valuable for a lot of people. And I'm not advocating for this. I, I, I'm no, just... but I, I think, do you think maybe that, I mean, this is, this might be, might seem a little torturous on my part to, to say this, but do you think that maybe the choke came from the fact that people didn't think that Simone de Beauvoir is worth praying to? Like maybe that's just where the choke came from. It was no, like. No, I, 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 it could have been. I, I thought about that, but, but, but the people were very honest. And in fact, they wanted to talk about why they were choking. And it was more. They, it was more towards something we talked about earlier. That it was the liminality of this, the in-betweenness. Uh, they wanted to say, like, Simone is, you know, you know the, the, I, I got a strong sense of the presence of the perspective. Because I make a distinction between the presence of the perspective and the full-blown presence of the person, right? Um, and, and, and they said, but that, the, it was that that was uncanny for them. And they th they they didn't want to speak it precisely because it would disturb the sort of stability of their categories. That was the sense I was getting. It was introducing them to a third way in which things are real, neither subjectively nor objectively. There's this other way they're real, the way Lerman talks about in her book, How God Becomes Real. And that third way of things being real was deeply disturbing to them. So this is, I'm using this as to say, I think if we try to enter into dialogos with these emerging aspects of reality, we're going to be encountering this third way in which things are real and people find it very, very challenging. That's now, I don't know yet. I, I, I understand what you're saying too, Jonathan. And I, I, I think I, I'm, not just, I'm not denying that that can also be a possibility. I don't think that was the case in the particular instance I was in. Hmm. Yeah, I would just uh, I'll invoke uh, that piece. Um, you know, we, Westerners, particularly Americans, for the past, oh, probably the totality of our being for the past 200 years or so, have been unreasonably reckless with regard to this particular question. So I'm noticing the importance of what Jonathan's presenting. Um, okay, so creating our proper boundaries and we're, we're entering into a space. John is, John is pointing out, hey, there's, a, uh, there's this place, there's this way of being in relationship that is real and, and important and present to the moment that we're in. Jonathan is saying, yes. By the way, we know a lot about this place. Be very careful when you enter into that room. Yes, yes, yes. Right. That's yeah. exactly my point, though. Yeah. I, 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 in fact, if that's what, you, uh, if, if that's what uh, Jonathan is saying, that's exactly my point. I, that's what I'm trying to get at with virtuosity yeah. and virtue, the proper care of this third way in which things are real. Because I agree with you, just flinging yourself into it is, is extremely foolish, right? Yeah, that's the point I, I'm bringing up. That's exactly the challenge I'm posing. Because there was a moment like this at the end of the 19th century, you know, when we have all these occultists that are very present. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have this moment where all of a sudden people started to notice that they could engage with these these beings and they could they could they could have seances, they could manifest them, they could get together and then you know someone would would channel something else and they became very fascinated by that because it was like hey something's happening, this is cool. It's like kids playing with a Ouija board, right? It's like hey, yeah. look this is actually doing something. And so, and I think that that's, that's maybe my, my reservation towards this type of behavior is that, that there are, is that it will, just because something happens and that things, you can engage these, these types of, of, of beings or these types of residues of beings, let's say, uh, it, yes, I think that there's a danger in that. And I, this is, I, I, I talked about that in terms of fascination with this, with how people become fascinated by the fact that all of a sudden they're able to perceive these, these, yeah. let's say, uh, hyper agents and, and higher beings. And so because of that, they lack the, the discernment and knowing why would I engage and how, and what is the proper way to do so? Is it just out of curiosity? Is it just out of, uh, 
you know, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish? And I, am I just trying to have some spiritual experience? Am I, is this aimed towards a higher good? Uh, yeah. And so I, those are all the questions that I would, that I would definitely ask. Mm-hmm. I agree. And, and, and just to give you probably not complete reassurance, but at least some, that is all part of what I, what is going on in these practices, right? Those questions are asked deeply and seriously. Uh, but yeah, I do worry. I do worry about the 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 the, the uh, sort of t- a, pen- a potential polarity here, which is like the, a foolish fascination, uh, or, or 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 kind of a and I I don't mean this necessarily religiously a fundamentalism that says no no there is no change to our ontology possible. Those are the two things we're trying to sail between here, hmm. um, and that's for me. Uh, like I, I think we need, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this is almost funny to say, uh, but, but we need sort of new virtues, it, 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 or or at least a a, 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 reno, a reinventio of uh, of uh, of some of the older virtues. I, I don't know quite what I'm saying, but like how to properly like we we like orient in that is the thing that I'm I'm bumping up against. Um, um, or maybe we need something like a fullness of the of of virtues in the sense that jordan talked about which is that there's a manner in which we've noticed the degrading of the words that we use we've noticed the degrading of words like faith words like beauty words like truth you know and so we've noticed that happening where now beauty just becomes pleasure you know uh, where faith just becomes believing in something unreasonable so we have these weird transformations that have happened over the past 500 years and so by recovering the actual the the actual highest version of these of these terms and of these of yeah, these yeah. meanings then we we run less a less a danger of going astray let's say and it's there like you i mean and i think john you know that that's why like i go back to to at least the authors the christian authors that i think have captured the highest version of, of christianity in their work it's like it's like saint gregory saint maximus you know uh these are the these are the saints that seem to have had the highest vision of of what it is that 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 these virtues or the way in which we can embody this reality in the world today is and so and the same with the philosophers like you know going to the neoplatonists going to yeah, to yeah, back yeah. to plato these yeah. are the ways that we can we can do this and i and i'm trying to do that Jonathan. yeah so like and 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 and, and jordan's right you, you know, like we're like that that i i like the latin term inventio to discover and 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 also to create uh but like, like the, the work I've been, the, the work I've been doing and the, the conversations I've been having about trying to reintegrate phenomenology with the theory of the forms so it doesn't become this abstract notion, but becomes this process, the eidetic adduction of literally trying to practice finding the through line, mm. through line in our intelligibility. That's what I mean about, and, and, if, and if you're right, that is in a sense a recovery of Plato, but it's a recovery of Plato that benefits from things after Plato, like phenomenology, right? And Marleau-Ponty, right? And so I'm very much trying to do that. And I, I, I guess what I'm asking for, and, and it's it, it's too great of an ask, I get it. But I'm trying to get like that. I, I, I'm trying to see how that, right, and 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 and, and, and how that can be brought into like the the proper dialogos relationship uh to because uh, i agree with you i to the 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 and that's again why i like you i'm exploring neoplatonism so deeply about how can we get a proper understanding of the orders of agency if you if you want to put it that way uh so that we can just avoid just you know the foolish fascination which is rampant but also the opposite, which is rampant, which is no, 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 no. Everything is fine. You stay with the ontology we've always had. Just work harder, boxer. Just work harder, right? Um, and, and so, sorry, I, I'm hoping this is being helpful. I, I feel for like me, like I'm moving forward in this conversation. I hope the two of you also feel that as well. Definitely. I have a, I have a, I, before we're, because I said we go until two, if you have a few more minutes, it seems like there's a good reason to talk about this just because it happened with it yesterday or a few days ago. Uh, if you followed this story about the Google employee who, who declared Lambda, one of the AI bots sentient. to be sentient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, so I, I mean, I, 
asking about its sentience, I think, is is irrelevant, at least to me, the actual sentience of the, the program. But the, the idea that this is, let's say that there's a scandal related to that. There's a scandal which is finding media attention related to someone saying this, getting fired or getting suspended because they are saying this. Have you put any thought into that, into what's going on right now? Yeah, I have. I mean, for, first of all, I, I, my whole career has been the, these pronouncements. Uh, Minsky famously said in 1967, within 10 years, computers won't even be keeping us as pets. We have to be really, we have to be, my response to any of these claims are initially skeptical. Uh, when, the, when the first versions of these came out, like, oh, I, uh, what are their names? One is Jurassic and the other, what is it, CPT3 or something, right? And, oh, look, look, it passes the train. All you do is just take the two of them and have them talk to each other for one minute. And they spin off in really weird shit, really fast, right? So there's a problem with, you know, human beings interacting with these things and saying, ah, because human beings have a tremendous capacity to find salient, find sentience in things that might not properly be sentient, right? And so that, to my mind, first of all, that's not the right test, right? The, the right test is for us to actually have them talk to each other and see if it goes off because that is much more powerful because they very quickly reciprocally narrow into weirdness, mm. right? Which, and, and that is the way of telling whether or not you've got a simulation in the, in, in the sense that Jordan was saying, or you've got an actual instantiation. So as a cognitive scientist, that's my first response. I, I wanna see the correct test, right? And I especially don't wanna hear the test of somebody that might've been involved in the creation of this because they're gonna be heavily invested right? Um, this is not a good scientific test. That being said, we might come to the day where that's the case. However, I doubt that it's going to be the kind of machines that are being offered right now, because there's good reason, I think, to believe that for there to be real intelligence, general intelligence, you have to be embodied, you have to be, be, uh, you, have to be so, you have to be properly social, you have to be emotional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the fact that our categories for terms like sentience are so impoverished that everybody freaks out. That's to me, the thing to really pay attention to here. Like, why isn't it that we get like, oh, well here, we've got a well thought out understanding of intelligence and sentience and consciousness. Let's discuss it and bring it to bear on this problem. No, no, no. We freak out. We, 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 we create some sort of crypto conspiracy theory. And, and like, like what, like for me, it's like, is, if this is what it claims to be, it is a scientific discovery and should be responded to in that fashion. The worst people to ask are the creator of it, right? The media and the politicians. This is properly, right, a scientific question. And I would want to- I would I have journalists to... somewhere, somewhere in that mix is just <laughs> yeah, yes. general purpose makes things worse. <laughs> what we, right? So as a cognitive scientist, uh, I have suspicions about it uh, because generally these machines are completely syntactic in nature and they work in terms of probability distributions, which means human beings can easily comport themselves and they will perform fantastically, but it's very quickly easy to reveal monstro monstrosity. doesn't mean there isn't real progress being made there, by the way. Mm -hmm. Jordan, do you have something to say about this? Yes, I do. Go for it. So, um, Maybe, maybe a way of putting it would be something like it's uh, this thing that we've been talking about a lot, um, the simulation. And the naming that I said that maybe we've been living 85% of our lives as humans, as civilized humans for the past, say, 30 or so thousand years in a simulation. I'm going to say that that is a paperclip optimizer, if you're familiar with that notion from kind of AI. AI has this, this, this metaphor of, of, of a risk of what happens if you produce a super intelligent AI uh, and task it with the responsibility of producing the most efficient maximum number of paper clips. And it accidentally converts the entire earth into nothing but a floating cloud of gravitationally bound paper clips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so a paper clip maximizer. And this is basically all that happens is when you, you yoke intelligence separate from sentience and sapience or yes. soul, yes. Uh, to a narrow local optimization function. Yes. 
Right? Yes. So we just describe civilization in more or less that same fashion. Right? It, it, it is that mob. It is that unconscious. It is the egregore in that, or that sort of variation that we were sort of brushing on a little bit. Um, you know, so I would take, not the opposite, I would take another perspective on this most recent, uh, how would you call it, fad? That's not bad. Fad's not bad. Um, the silliness with which such a large fraction of our collective intelligence was effusively oriented towards something is, is just evidence of the ease by which a relatively mediocre AI, if improperly deployed, could take advantage of our lower natures and the decadent corruption and otherwise uh, profane aspects of, our, of the paperclip maximizer in which we live to further the process of converting us all into paper clips. Hmm. <laughs> that's, that's so this, this is the problem that I see. Um, it's less a problem of sort of like everything's hunky dory, but we accidentally create, you know, Terminator two or something like that. It's more like it's all part of a, of a reciprocal narrowing that we yeah. call civilization and that we're, we're living within. And we need to actually find our way out of that in general. Um, hmm. Can I, can I loop a little bit of this last piece about, um, well, let's just say prayer, the way you described it, Jonathan, like yeah. you, you said, perhaps they didn't want to pray to Simone. Um, over a few years ago, I found myself in an interesting conversation with some, uh, a variety of different folks from the, from the North American indigenous community, different, different, different bands and tribes. And somebody said something that I thought was quite nice. He said that, um, in Silicon Valley, there's a phrase that has, uh, how would you call it? It's just it has obvious currency, which is information wants to be free. And he said to his people, nothing more absurd could possibly be uttered. That information is quite often extremely dangerous. And uh, the proper thing is to have the proper people holding the proper competencies in a proper way in support of what is in fact a wholesome way of life. Um, and in some sense, it's obvious, right? We don't want to give the sort of the keys to the nuclear codes to literally everybody. Um, but these, this is true in general. If you really think about it all the way through, this capacity to be humans in relationship with being and to speak meaning in the world is profoundly powerful. Uh, and AI just happens to be an example of that profound power. But, but the whole point is the whole fucking thing is profoundly powerful. And learning how to enter into right relationship with that capacity, particularly because since we're in medias res, right, we're, we're sort of, none of us are grownups and yet all of us have capacity, um, is quite meaningfully important right now. Uh, and so what I would propose is to take the thing, that sort of practice that you were talking about, John, uh, Dialogos, and for almost everybody, the safe place to practice Dialogos is like with your wife or with mm. your child around ordinary life, like the simplest, most basic, ordinary, wholesome human experiences, practice dialogos there until you're very good at it. Then consider the possibility of moving into more sort of potent practices of dialogos. By the way, you won't be able to help it. It will simply enter more and more and more into your life. Um, but the more it's grounded to ordinary life, the more it's grounded to how we are just making the choice that's in front of you better, the more it's able to be in service to ordinary life. And then it is woven back into livingness and not in this space where we bring things into sorcery service from the top down. Yeah, yeah. Wrong, wrong top, by the way, from the simulated top down, which gets in the way of our relationship with the top. Um, and that, like, that distinction strikes me as being sort of a fundamental distinction at this moment. Which, the distinction between sorcery and theurgia or the distinction you made in practice? Yeah, the distinction of, of practice, the distinction yeah. of weaving our potency in relationship with meaningfulness, with in relationship with life, the actual, the real actual life that you're living moment to moment, bring it into service of that first and keep it at that level of scale. And mm -hmm. don't do the sorcerer's apprentice thing and avoid the sorcerer's apprentice thing at all costs. Once you've become capable of bringing a higher degree of, of beauty and life and life, aliveness in the relationships that are directly in front of you, then expand. You know, build that capacity if, by the way, that is yours to do. This goes back to that notion of living Kairos properly. Mm. You know, if it turns out that your moment of living Kairos properly is to bring something in service to the Logos in a powerful way, then do what is yours to do. Um, but 
probably still practice, <laughs> you know, to do it artfully in, in, in a power, very powerful way. Mm. No, I think, I think that that's probably, at least for me, that's probably a great way to, to finish this. I think you're totally right. And, and I think it, it does wrap up a little bit, all the things that we were saying, that is that, that we have a certain amount of capacity to affect the world. And that, that is, especially like if we think of hyper agents, for example, like the, the, the big, the closest hyper agent you'll have to deal with is your family. Like that is the closest one that you have with you. And it's like, you can build that into something that isn't parasitic. And that is, that is together Ooh. in a higher, in higher participations. Then I think that it's like, maybe that's the best thing you can do, you know, apart that, from, that would, I would, I would actually say one, one thing closer. Yeah. For, for almost all beings alive today, the closest type of agent is yourself. Yeah, exactly. I was actually going exactly there. I was going to say, apart from like move, bringing all these broken processes within you together in yourself, like then, then after that, like you said, it's with your, your, your close, close people. So, so guys, thanks for this conversation. I definitely would like to, to continue it and to, to have more because I, I think that this is the question that everybody's thinking about and everybody's asking. So I need some time to think about what we talked about today, but I would like to continue if you, if you agree. Well, uh, uh, then I'll end with a provocation. Go for it. Provoke us, John. The advice that you uh, both made is good advice. Uh, The problem is that, um, uh, again, we're, uh, we're, I I think we also need to get people into a relationship with um, people other than their family and their friends. This is the notion of fellowship. Mm -hmm. Um, And that we need that and we need part of the fellowship and to use your language, Jonathan, we need part of the fellowship is the communion of the saints and that um, they have to be part of the family too, in some way. If, mm. if, if Plato and Socrates can't enter and be part of my family, then I'm kind of doomed in a way. So I don't want to, I'm not rejecting the advice you gave, but I'm turning it into a provocation. Granted what you said is correct, Jordan, and I agree with Jonathan, and I think it is right. Nevertheless, right? Well, there's yeah. a very beautiful way of synthesizing that, which is to remember that the word family means those who love most. Yes. Right. All right. Well, that's great. And, uh, and I'll, I'll give my last provocation to you, John. I'll say that's why I tell people to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So I'll stop talking. Uh, uh, I just want to say thank you. I yeah, thanks to both of you. This has been wonderful. And uh, we'll I, definitely set up. I, another... I really. By the way, that was me saying yes to any future conversation. All right. Yeah, great. Me, me too. I really found that uh, there was a tripolar thing between us that really gave a powerful field of exploration. I really felt the logos coming into the conversation very powerfully. Um, and so just thank you both. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks. To you. And we'll, we'll talk again. All right. Take good care.